pitter-patter heart, tiptoeing through one moment, galloping the next. All right. So <clears throat> this is what classrooms used to look like. Uh, and this is the famous classroom uh, in Italy, the Teatro, or the theater, sorry, pardon me, of uh, Girolamo Fabrizio d'Acquapedante. I wish I could say that more uh, musically than I did. But um, this is where <laughs> Venus Bowels were first demonstrated. So all the students would stand above, and uh, someone would press a Venus valve, and then you could clear the upstream, uh, or the downstream, because it's heading to the heart, uh, the downstream chamber, and the, there would be no backflow of blood because the valve here would prevent, uh, would prevent blood from flowing back into the chamber. This is where that was first um, uh, demonstrated. You can try it on yourself. Has everybody done that at some point? Uh, red corpuscles were first identified by Van Leeuwenhoek, um, and these were, uh, this is a, our drawings of the first um, red blood cells that were made in the Arcana Natura in 1695, uh, the very first time humans uh, were able to look at the corpuscles. And then uh, about 150 years later, a little more than that, Lionel Beale um, here had a much more detailed uh, picture. He called this red and white corpuscles. Um, and published this in 1863 after uh, microscopy had improved. And so here we can begin to actually identify some of the types of uh, blood cells. We have uh, monocytes, we have platelets, we sort of have, pardon me, uh, the red blood cells, uh, maybe uh, a uh, polymorphonuclear leukocyte there. All right, so one of the things I want to start doing uh, to try to help you guys is to give you objectives for the lecture uh, beforehand. Uh, the objective for the lecture, we're going to talk about blood all day today. I'm going to start by just a couple slides about the basic function of blood and uh, the structure of a red blood cell and hemoglobin. I'm going to tell you how blood typing happens, and, um, and then there's going to be a little bit about how, one slide about how red blood cells recycle and hemostasis, another slide about that, which is blood clotting. And then time permitting, I will talk uh, a bit about blood-related pathology, so sickle cell anemia, anemia and hemolytic anemia of the new newborn. I'm going to give a trigger warning if we do indeed get to this uh, topic today. Uh, there are some, if there's anybody here who's had any contact with hemolytic anemia of the newborn, I have a couple uh, startling images of that. Um, so if, if anybody is sensitive to that, they should let me know beforehand or be warned. Um, they're, they're in there. All right. So <clears throat> body fluids. Uh, the average adult is about 40 liters uh, of, of fluid, and that's approximately 60% of your body weight. Um, this is divided into three compartments, okay? Uh, and when you, if you were to ask someone, where is all the fluid in your body, they would probably say, well, it's all in your blood, right? No, you do not have 40 liters of blood. In fact, you only have uh, <clears throat> uh, about three liters of plasma um, at any one point in time. That's about uh, 20%. Uh, the interstitial fluid surrounding your cells that's much larger, that's approximately 12 uh, liters, 80% of the extracellular fluid, which itself is only 20% of your body weight uh, at 15 liters. And then it is the, the, the majority of the fluid in your body is inside the cells themselves, okay? Tongue twister. That's 25 liters, that's 40% of your body weight. That is the fluid that's inside um, your cells. <clears throat> All right. What does blood do? Well, um, if I were to ask you, I imagine that many of you would say that uh, it would, you would tell me the first thing. It's going to help transport dissolved substances, oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, various uh, nutrients, hormones, waste cells, immune cells. Uh, it is the logistics uh, 
It's the logistics carrier in the blood, uh, in the body. So it also is going to regulate uh, the pH. It acts as a buffer, uh, regulating the pH of the body and various uh, ions. Um, the blood also prevents fluid loss. This is hemostasis. So you have an injury. Uh, the blood has components in it that are going to help uh, prevent that fluid loss. The white blood cells that are in the blood uh, are your primary defense against various pathogens and some toxins. Um, more than that, the blood, because of the, the heat capacity of water, the high heat capacity of water, helps to stabilize your body temperature. Um, 40 liters of water has quite a significant, uh, it's a, quite a significant heat sink and acts uh, to resist <coughs> rapid change in, in the core temperature. When we take uh, a sample of blood uh, here by venipuncture, uh, we, we collect it. <coughs> And then we can fractionate it. This process of fractionation is separating whole blood into its uh, constituent parts uh, for analysis. So uh, the blood volume itself is only 7% of body weight. Uh, that's uh, 5 to 6 liters in males and four to five liters in females. And you may say, wow, I just told you that plasma was only three liters. Well, that means that a significant component of that is going to be uh, represented by formed elements, by the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and other things that are taking up that volume. So that's what this is referring to here. Okay. A person who is hypovolemic uh, means they have a low blood volume, and uh, conversely, hypervolemia is uh, a high blood volume. So uh, when you spin blood down, um, it's going to be it's going to consist of uh, two parts: the plasma, which is uh, the aqueous portion, and then the formed elements. That aqueous portion uh, also contains uh, various uh, solutes. So let's look through them one at a time. First, the plasma. All right. Um, this breaks down into two different categories. There's proteins and everything else. There's a bunch of proteins in your blood. Um, and by far, the greatest uh, percentage of those proteins in the blood are the albumins. That's about 60% of the blood. Uh, they, are, they do a whole host of, of things. The albumins are a super family. Uh, proteins um, that I have a few things listed there. Uh, they help maintain osmotic pressure, of course. They transport lipids, steroid hormones, um, etc. The next big superfamily are the globulins, and uh, these proteins, there's, they're quite varied. Um, so immunoglobulins uh, are your antibodies. Uh, there are also uh, globulins that serve as hormones. Uh, I'm sorry transport mechanisms for ions, hormones, and lipids, uh, like the albumins. Uh, another in, not insignificant component of these proteins is fibrinogen. And fibrinogen, what did I tell you? Or no, maybe I'm confusing a previous semester. Um, any protein that you see that has ogen on it, um, that is uh, a, that is a non-activated, an apo. Uh, enzyme. So, fibrinogen is the inactive form of fibrin. Uh, there's going to be some cleavage event that's going to trim a regulatory peptide off of fibrinogen. It'll become fibrin. When that happens, uh, this is an important part of laying down uh, those clotting uh, webs that are essential to hemostasis. So, if we go back to Beale's uh, image, of uh, the red and white corpuscles, you notice there were cables all over that drawing, those little threads that were connecting everything. Those were likely to be fibrin, uh, uh, fibrin fibers that he was seeing in uh, clotting blood in his sample. Um, and then there is uh, less than 1% of the proteins 
uh, contains the bulk of the diversity of the proteins. There's a tremendous number of proteins that are there in vanishing quantities uh, that uh, have all kinds of purposes. Um, usually the regulatory proteins uh, of some sort that can be enzymes, proenzymes, hormones, uh, etc. Then there's the rest, the other solutes. You're going to have uh, three categories here. Electrolytes. Uh, this is sodium, potassium, calcium, all the metal ions, uh, and, and both cations and anions. Um, and then there are going to be organic nutrients, uh, such as glucose, um, various lipids, amino acids, uh, etc. And these are going to be used for ATP production uh, in, in the cells. And then finally, uh, these are going to be the waste products. And so these are usually nitrogen-containing uh, waste products that are going to be excreted uh, into uh, the urine. <clears throat> All right. So here are a couple characteristics of whole blood I didn't point out before. Uh, your blood likes to be at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38C. Uh, it's very high viscosity, um, your blood, because it, it has such a high osmolarity with all these solutes in it. It's got a very high viscosity. Um, and then the pH is it's slightly alkaline. Your blood is alkaline. Um, it likes to be in a very narrow window of 7.35 to 7.45. It doesn't want to be outside of that range. All right. Now, <clears throat> the formed elements. Uh, when, you do a, when you do a hematocrit or a spin down of blood, you have the plasma, what's called a buffy coat. This is all the white blood cells because they are the largest of the cells. That uh, accumulates at the top. And then the red blood cell pack um, is at the bottom of a centrifuge tube. Um, <clears throat> the platelets and the white blood cells are only about a tenth of a percent of all the cells there. The vast majority of the cells are red blood cells. Um, the... <clears throat> Red blood cells are about 7 micrometers in diameter. That's an important number because it acts as a reference range when you're trying to identify these other cells uh, in a smear, in a blood smear. Uh, we have neutrophils uh, or polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Uh, they have these oddly shaped um, nuclei. Eosinophils with their horseshoe-shaped uh, nucleus. Basophils are extremely rare. So neutrophil is, is or, uh, or PMNs, are by far the most common of the white blood cells. Basophils are very, very rare. Um, you're not likely to see basophils uh, in, a, in a typical blood smear. And then there are uh, the lymphocytes. These are the T and the B cells. Um, T cells are activating cells that, that help B cells produce the antibodies that are necessary for an immune response. And then there are the monocytes, these uh, large, the largest of uh, the leukocytes. Just telling you who the players are. Are there any questions on this? We're not going to go into depth about the function of any of these cells. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit. I shouldn't say that. I am going to talk about the red blood cells, I'm just mentioning the white blood cells. So red blood cells are, are pretty unique cells. They do not have uh, nuclei. Uh, they don't have any mitochondria. They don't have any ribosomes. What could you uh, surmise about the physiology of a red blood cell from that. If I were to just tell you, look, they have no nuclei, no mitochondria, and no ribosomes, what would you guess about the basic function of a red blood cell, the, the life cycle of a, a red blood cell? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's an interesting guess because you are uh, relating it to uh, cells that don't have nuclei. But no, they are not prokaryotic. They are, they are in fact, eukaryotic. At the beginning of uh, their development, they have uh, nuclei which uh, resolve themselves. But what else would you say? Yeah. They don't divide. They're not dividing. In fact, they're not even repairing. They are not able to do anything except bind oxygen and go from point A to point B. They have no mitochondria, so there is no metabolism, no appreciable metabolism happening there. Uh, they have no ribosomes, so they cannot make new proteins. 
They have no DNA, so they don't even have the, like, pattern to make more proteins if they wanted. Because of this, they have a limited lifespan. A, a red blood cell only lives for 120 days, about four months. Okay? Uh, when you look at them, they have this uh, sort of breath mint shape here. Can anybody guess why that might be? Why isn't it just a round ball? Why would it be a sort of dimpled wedge? Mm -hmm. More of surface area? Exactly. Exactly. I will resist the temptation to go into my discussion of surface area to volume dimensional analysis. But um, yeah, there's a high surface area uh, for a limited volume. Um, also, what's interesting about uh, the shape of a red blood cell is they're, because of this disc-like shape that they have, they're able to stack on top of one another like this and pass through extraordinarily small uh, vessels. So they're, they're going through, they're only 7 micrometers. They can pass through uh, a passageway that is roughly 7 micrometers. That is incredibly tiny. They form what are called rouleaux. Uh, a, a rouleau is a stack of red blood cells, and it is this uh, rouleau pattern which enables uh, for passage of red blood cells through a, um, through a capillary bed. These red blood cells are full of hemoglobin. Well, what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin uh, is a tetrameric protein. There are four subunits. There are four uh, subunits that, that are individually expressed and then self-associate that are packed together to form hemoglobin. Uh, two of those four are alpha chains, so they're identical. There are two alpha chains, and then there are two beta chains. So here are the alpha, here are the beta. Each alpha and beta uh, has associated with it this porphyrin ring, this whole, so ignoring the iron there, all of this stuff is called the porphyrin ring. That's a porphyrin ring structure. Think of it like uh, a trampoline or maybe a dream catcher, or I don't know the metaphor you want, um, spider web. But whatever's holding it together is this iron that can coordinate uh, right in the middle of those of those four uh, of those four nitrogens that are sitting there. It is this iron that gives blood its red color. The oxidation state of the iron is what gives uh, blood its red color, and uh, is the site for binding of oxygen. All right. We will talk about the function of hemoglobin hemoglobin in much more detail when we get to the respiratory chapter. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to leave hemoglobin where it lays uh, for now, except to say that uh, in male, uh, the adult male, there's about 14 to 18 grams per deciliter in whole blood, and female is about 12 to 16 grams per deciliter in whole blood. I'm not expecting you to know these numbers. I am simply pointing, uh, I'm pointing out the reference ranges for you for uh, comparison. Are there questions on that? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Are you going to talk a little bit about what, what the difference is in that we're just seeing or what causes those? Well, no, I'm not, actually. Uh, not in this class. But may, I may in the future uh, teach biology of gender class. And if I do, I will talk about it then. Um, okay, blood typing. So, <clears throat> red blood cells have different antigens that are presented on their surface. Is anybody <coughs> not familiar with the term antigen? Don't be shy, because I will happily define it. Everybody understands the word antigen. There are, um, in this, there, there's more than two types, but for this discussion, we're going to talk about uh, type A antigen, which is depicted there, is this little round red thing. And uh, this uh, type B antigen, which is a blue triangle. During uh, 
thymic deletion, which is a process that happens postpartum, that first week postpartum after a baby is born. Uh, the thymus goes through a process, which is this uh, gland that is sitting, this organ that is sitting on top of your heart, goes through this process of deleting out all of the B cells that produce self-reactive uh, antibodies. So antibodies that react to the self. You make antibodies, rather than explicitly coding antibodies, you have this amazing random machine in your genetic code that can, through its various permutations, uh, produce an enormous number of antibodies to virtually anything that's out there, okay? Problem is, some of those are self-reactive, and we need to delete those from the population of B cells at birth, okay, when you have a naive immune system. So, um, if you have surface antigen to A, the, the B cells that recognize A are killed at birth. Your body makes anti-B antibodies because they don't recognize them as the self. So if, you're, if you have type A blood, you have A antigen on your red blood cells and you make anti-B antibody. If you are type B, it's just the reverse. If you are AB, you have both antigens, both antigens uh, on, your, on your surface, and you make neither <coughs> antibody. You make neither antibody. These people are called universal acceptors. They can take blood from anybody. You can stick blood in this person that's type A because they don't have a, uh, type A antibodies. You can stick type B blood in them. They don't have type B uh, antibodies. Or you can stick type O. O doesn't have either of them. They are uh, universal donors. You can put this blood cell in anybody because it's naked. However, they can only receive type O. That's the downside of being type O. Fortunately, most of us are type O. It's the majority of blood, so it's not that big a deal. Um, and here we go. Here's, a, here's surface antigen. If you were to take type B blood and stick it into a type A person who has these anti-B uh, antibodies, these antibodies would recognize those antigens, and it would, uh, that would uh, trigger agglutination and the complement cascade and a destruction of those cells. We're not going to go through in detail. But this is a process called hemolysis. All right. So to take this notion of hemolysis a bit further uh, in, into its natural uh, progression. So these red blood cells, I told you they last for four months. They, got, they have to be recycled. Um, and you recycle approximately 1% uh, of your red blood cells every day. That's about, prepare yourself, 3 million per second. That's incredible. Woo. 3 million cells every second your body is turning over. So here's the erythropoiesis that happens in the marrow of your, cell, uh, your bones. Uh, here's this red blood cell. It does its business for uh, three, four months. 90% um, of that uh, is absorbed uh, by macrophages that are in your liver, spleen, or in the bone marrow. And they, uh, they go through the process of hemolysis, breaking down, they get broken down. Uh, the amino acids, the protein, uh, are going to get recycled and shuttled back along with the, uh, the iron, uh, and that's in the heme. Uh, and then the heme itself is going to be broken down into a pigment called biliverdin, uh, which then gets broken down into another called bilirubin. Uh, bilirubin uh, it binds to the albumin. I talked about albumin as being a transport protein in the blood. Um, and uh, in the liver, if it wasn't created there in the first place, uh, it's transported to the liver. In the liver, bilirubin um, becomes what's called one of the bile salts. And the bile salts have um, a variety of functions. Um, we call this biliverdin because it's green and bilirubin because uh, it's red. Uh, 
um, uh, they are excreted in the bile, and uh, the bile is responsible for uh, solubilizing fats. Um, once in the colon, uh, much of it gets converted to uh, urobilins and stericobilins uh, and is eliminated in the feces. So this is uh, what gives your feces the characteristic brown color that it has. It's the red and the, and the green pigments from the bile salts. Some of that uh, gets put back into the blood and uh, is excreted uh, via the kidney. There is 10% that makes this pathway uh, directly through uh, hemolysis that is not uh, mediated by uh, a phagocytic cell. Uh, Were there a question? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Where's the recycling? Like, that's just mostly waste is Right, right. Uh, the recycling, what I'm, I guess what I'm, okay. the recycling is uh, in some of the heme, some of the proteins, and most of the iron okay. are, are maintained. This is just showing how we shunt the porphyrin ring out, okay, which is a very incredibly small component of a, of a red blood cell in terms of its actual mass. So, yeah, the bulk of it is kind of minimized in this, this little loop up here. Okay. Good question, though. Yeah. What's the purple structure? That's a phagocyte. Yeah, like a macrophage of some sort. No, you had a question. No. Oh. All right. Anybody else? Uh, hemostasis. So, hemostasis is. I'll, I'll preface it by saying this. It is like if you thought that AMPK and insulin signaling is complicated. Hemostasis makes that look like child's play. It is an incredibly complicated, multi-step, parallel process, okay, which I am not even going to touch. Um, but this is, this is like the one slide, uh, quick and dirty here. So we have a cut. Uh, first thing that happens is this spasm. It's the vascular phase of hemostasis. The smooth muscle... Uh, in the capillary or whatever that's been cut uh, has, contracts and tries to restrict blood flow uh, to uh, that area. All right, so there's uh, this um, uh, vasospasm that happens at the site of injury. Um, and then we move on to the platelet phase. So platelets are... Uh, tiny little cell fragments. They are anuclear uh, little cell fragments that um, self-associate. And we get, um, you know, there's this, when you have an injury, there's going to be a release of various pro-inflammatory uh, compounds from the disrupted cells uh, that are going to trigger this platelet ag uh, aggregation. All right, and so the platelets... Um, begin to plug the hole and release uh, these various chemicals. So they're going to give up some ADP, um, some th chemicals called thromboxane A2. Uh, calcium is going to be released and various other platelet factors. Um, and this is going to start a, uh, a coagulation cascade, which is, is quite sophisticated. All right. Once uh, the platelet plug has begun to form over uh, the that cut edge, uh, we get into this coagulation uh, phase. And this happens in under uh, a minute, typically, after the injury. So there's the damage that leads, uh, uh, that leads to the calcium efflux by the, the uh, platelets. And this uh, triggers these clotting factors, uh, which then, uh, the, the result of which is to uh, activate fibrinogen cleaving off the regulatory uh, peptide and allowing fibrin to get, begin to self-associate and lay down this meshwork uh, that's reinforcing the platelet plug. All right? Um, so here we can begin to see what you have. You have various, there's some sort of cut here, uh, some injury with platelets interspersed in here. You can see red blood cells that have gotten embedded uh, in that plug, 
and then uh, fibrin uh, begins to lay itself uh, on top of on top of that uh, structure. All right, so that's that's the basic three phases: the vascular, platelet, and coagulation phase of hemostasis. Um, all right. So now I want to spend uh, just a few minutes talking. Were, were the questions on that? Is this the right pace? Because many of you had wanted me to go slower, and I'm trying. OK. Um, <clears throat> so anemia. I'm going to back up now. Um, anemia is simply the reduced ability to transport oxygen. It's reduced oxygen carrying capacity. And uh, that's because you have a low hemoglobin in your low hemoglobin count. So this could be because you have low red blood cell count. It could be because you are low in iron. It could be for other reasons, all right? Um, but anemia is a general term that relates to the reduced carrying capacity of, uh, of oxygen in the blood. Uh, many women suffer from anemia because of their menstrual cycles and not enough iron to replace iron that would be lost during that. Um, a specific type of anemia is called sickle cell anemia. Uh, this is uh, due to a glutamic acid to valine substitution at uh, the sixth amino acid in uh, uh, the uh, hemoglobin chain, which allows uh, this uh, deoxygenated form of hemoglobin to not just self-associate into the typical tetramer, but instead we get this agglutinated uh, chain <coughs> that forms here, right? And so the hemoglobin itself just doesn't form properly um, at all and leads to these uh, sickle cell uh, red blood cells. We see them, we see them uh, here in this, in this smear. Uh, they're not able to uh, deliver hemoglobin as well. That clock is right. Yeah. Um, and they also have, there's a lot of thrombotic problems. They get caught in capillaries. Um, there's a, a number of problems that they have. Um, it's an interesting disease, which I'm not going to dive into more than that. I'm going to talk about a hemolytic disease of the newborn for the last uh, five minutes here. Has anybody heard of this before? OK. Um, so this is a problem for mothers. So one of these antigens on the surface that I didn't talk about was the rhesus factor. It's another antigen. Uh, so you can be Rh positive or Rh negative blood. It's just like A and B, all right? Uh, well, a little bit different. But it is an antigen on the surface of your red blood cells. So it, if an Rh negative mother, meaning a mother who does not have this antigen, marries an Rh positive husband, uh, and they have a uh, Rh, I guess they don't have to be married, I'm sorry to impose that uh, on there. But if the father is Rh positive, uh, and they have an Rh positive baby, um, there's this discontinuity. And the danger here lies if during birth, at delivery, there's some sort of hemorrhage where a little bit of the Rh positive blood from the baby gets into the mother's bloodstream. Uh, what happens is that mother is going to get sensitized and she's going to mount an immune response. It's not going to do anything to her. It's not going to do anything to her, but now her system has been primed with a bunch of um, Rh antibodies, Rh reactive antibodies. So if she gets pregnant a second time, if she gets pregnant a second time and has an Rh, a second Rh positive infant, um, it can be a real problem because those antibodies can pass through the placental barrier and begin to destroy this, uh, the, inf the fetuses Rh positive red blood cells. Okay, major problem. Um, so, <clears throat> how do you test for this? Well, there's this Coombs test. A direct Coombs test is one of the signs. Uh, you have 
you draw some blood from the mother, and you see that uh, here there are um, <coughs> antibodies. You put the, cu the Coombs uh, reagent in, and we get a positive test result. We get agglutination. All right. So here, here are the sort of disturbing images. Um, some other signs are elevated bilirubin uh, due to the hemolysis, right? We're breaking down the red blood cells in the fetus. Uh, and so you're going to have an in elevated bilirubin in the, uh, in the placenta, uh, in the cord. And you're going to have uh, anemia in that infant. This leads in the baby to jaundice. So this baby is yellow because of an increased amount of uh, bilirubin and biliverdin in the blood, right? So when somebody is jaundiced, they have liver failure. There's, there's going to be destruction of uh, red blood cells. It increases uh, the, the, the bilirubin content. There's also an enlargement of the liver, which you can't see here, and a distension of the abdomen. That's typical of these uh, children. Uh, in extreme cases, you can have what's called uh, hydrops fetalis, and this is uh, heart failure due to prenatal, uh, the, the immune response, uh, and this having heart failure leads to extreme edema. Edema is swelling, tissue swelling. So you look at this, this poor little girl here, uh, and she is would have been entirely healthy except for the mother's immune system, right? Um, so she has severe swelling and edema because her mother's immune system uh, started attacking this Rh-positive uh, baby. <coughs> this is entirely preventable. This is entirely preventable. This is uh, one of the reasons back in the day, they don't do this a lot um, as much as they should probably now, but you would have to, to get a uh, marriage license, the mother and the father would have to get blood testing to see, to know if you are at risk for this. Uh, if you know that there's a mother that is Rh negative and a po father that's Rh positive, because Rh positive is dominant uh, allele, um, you can prevent it. So you can give an unsensitized mother the <coughs> stuff. Uh, it's an Rh immunoglobin, uh, an anti-Rh uh, antibody immunoglobin called Rogam. You give them at 28 weeks in uh, to the mother, and this is going to prevent the interaction of the mother's antibodies and uh, from reacting with any Rh positive cells. So it prevents her from becoming sensitized. All right, um, that's a standard. That's a standard procedure, and it and it completely avoids what is clearly a tragic um, situation. I did it. I got to the end without rushing. Are there any questions? No? Uh, so next time, I'm going to talk about how the heart works. Next lecture, how the heart works.